All right, so you should. So right now what you're seeing, it's a demo machine that uh, we have set up here in the lab. Um, unfortunately, I'm not uh, set up correctly to send you the actual output of the server. So you'll only be able to see the, uh, the screen and not you know, the on-air output or the, if you would, you know, in, the, in reality, you would have an SDI monitor or another kind of monitoring to see the output. Um, so the, auto, the automation system of MaestroVision it consists of basically two main parts. There is the, what we call the playlist manager, which is basically the client application and the server itself, uh, which is, uh, there's nothing to see, it's a, serv a Windows service basically that runs in the background. Uh, it's uh, the way that it's structured is like any server client application that are, you're used to, basically you have one server and you can have as many playlist manager as you want and it can be installed on multiple computers to allow multiple operators to work at the same time. Obviously, you can't work on exactly the same thing because you know if one person clicks, you know, start and the other click stop, one will win and the other will lose. But you're able to see you have multiple channels in the server. You can have one operator for channel A, one operator for channel B, you can have someone else doing ingest and different, you can parallelize tasks in that way. And since it's all done over a standard TCP IP network, you can also have, uh, you know, remote locations as well. Uh, so if you have, uh, let's say, a remote station and you can remote in, you can use a remote place manager to control it. And you don't need necessarily to have someone physically, you know, at the server like uh, in the past. So I'll, and the automation, basically, as you're probably aware, sends commands. Uh, our automation supports most video servers out there. So it, obviously it supports our video server, but also we, we've worked with uh, K2s from Grass Valley with uh, the, um, uh, the Leech one, sorry, the, um, the Nexio from Aris, which is Imagine now and other versions of it. Um, so we, ha we have a wide var variety of protocol that we do interface with. Uh, we also control various switchers, whether it be AJ, Blackmagic, Leech or other higher end uh, broadcast uh, master control switcher um, or routers. So it's it's only we've we've been uh, over the years. As Claude has, uh, was saying, we've been around for over twenty years. So and we've got uh, quite a uh, impressive library of uh, driver for various switchers. Some of them, you know, who are not around anymore. But uh, basically, if you have a switcher, we're usually able to control it unless that switcher is built not to be controlled, which would be kind of odd. Um, and we also interface with other graphic box, whether it be our own channel dresser or other like logo motion uh, or uh, other other graphics uh, generator that are out there. So if we take a look a little bit at the interface, you'll see that automation interface, uh, there are a few other companies um, that are out there. Honestly, when you look at broadcast product, the one that is the most similar is automation, as in, you know, automation uh, is very straightforward. It basically, it's, a, it's always a playlist, start time, end time, it sends command, it starts to play. So there are variation, of course, in the way that you do those tasks, but overall, it's always the same core functionality that you will find in there. Um, the, what does, so it basically you have here at the top, the playlists, so the list of playlists, typically you would have things like, this here, you know, one for Friday, one for Saturday, so one place per day, which is what we recommend to customers. Uh, it, it is not at all a technical requirement. You could have, you know, a playlist for every hour, or you can have a playlist for a whole month if you want. Uh, the server for him, it doesn't really care, but for operational purposes, usually what is most flexible is one playlist per day, because it tends to be what you get out of your traffic, and it gives you more flexibility to change the next day and you know, all together in a single change. Um, here on the lower left-hand corner, you have what we call the materials. Materials are files, but not just files. There's, it's important to see the difference between materials and files. Every time you play something, it's a material. So a material will reference a file. For instance, uh, let me go here in the list I have, let's say and pick two files here, let's say how, there is a file attached to it. I'll make this a little bit bigger so that you guys can see it. Display the path. Uh, so you have a file name attached to it. And here we have validation. You see here the one is in red. The status says media not found. So this is a good example. Basically, it's a file. We were telling the system you will find this file with this name. 
and that's the house number. It should have this duration and all of the metadata associated with it. However, the system is warning you, that's all well and good. However, that file is not there at the moment, which is, can be normal because in situation, you will want to create your playlist and prepare your playout in advance because you may get the file, you know, well, hopefully more than five minutes before it goes to air because that's a bit the cutting it short, but you know, it can be in production, it's gonna come later on. What you typically will see is you'll have a bunch of red lines for what will play it's in the afternoon because it's shows that are being filmed in the morning and they're replays, but since in the morning they're live, they don't exist yet. Um, so that is one thing with some automations out there for smaller um, broadcast companies, um, some automations are limited to only schedule files. Um, it's not true of the larger automation like Imagine System and, uh, and the Fluffy Cal and Sundance in the past. So those were allowed you to play content that what we call the material, but some smaller system are limited to files. So that is usually a big difference between the lower end automation system and the higher end ones. Um, so when, when I say lower end, I'm talking about systems you know, which are more geared toward community stations or local access stations and that type of uh, market. Um, so here are your materials. Keep in mind the materials, they can be MPEG-2, which are files. So those are, would be played by the video server. And we can also have here a type, what we call type other. Those are just switcher only. And we can all, you know, logo events. We can have overlays. So there's various type of material, which are all scheduled. So I'll make this a little bit smaller so we can take a look at the playlist. There are many ways of building the playlist itself because you know the, the content of what you want is actually what is played when. That is the heart and soul of what an automation system does. So the, in, with our system, the easiest way to make a quick playlist is you can just grab a material and you can come and drop it inside the playlist wherever you want it and it will get added. Uh, we have what we call the chain trigger command which basically calculates the start time based on you know after the end time of the one above and everyone else is pushed back. So everything is neat and tied together. Uh, in Usually in most stations, you will have a traffic system or at least uh, some sort of a file to import the playlist from. Um, so you will get that file, whether it be an XML, CSV, whatever the format and import it directly, but you are able to do it manually. Smaller stations will do it. You only know, do the schedule on paper or in an Excel spreadsheet, and they will redo it in the automation. Um, it depends on you know how much content they have. You have some stations out there, you know, which they they have, uh, especially like smaller access stations. Some of them, it's a, it's a big show of four hour in the morning. Then it's Bolton board for twelve hour. Then it's the two or three shows of an hour, and then it's back to Bolton board. So if it's ten events a day, you know, dragging. 10 lines a day, that's very easy and very manageable. If you're a bigger station where you have, you know, 30 minute shows with uh, about 10 to 15 ads in each of these shows, well, 30 minute show, that means there are 48 shows per day, plus all the ads. If it's 10 ads per show, then, you know, it's uh, 240 ads. So it's around three, 400 lines easily. And that's a small playlist. So at that number, usually you will not want to drag them manually one after the other. But you're always able also to change them in the playlist. So let's say you notice an error or a mistake, you can always change them. Um, I'll actually start the playlist so that you can see while it's playing. One thing that is neat about the MaestroVision automation is you're able to change element even though the one in green is playing, the one in yellow is what we call queued or waiting, but you are able to change any line you want at any time. So you see here, I drag the line, and so it will requeue the line to be ready. Obviously, it's a double-edged sword because if you do that, you know, it still needs a few seconds to prepare the file. So if you do it, you know, half a second before it starts playing, you will probably have a bit of black on there. But if you have enough time and you know it enough in advance, you can do any change and naturally anything that is not queued is still movable around. So once the playlist is playing, basically it will, it starts and you see here I started at 12, uh, 16. Uh, this one, I'll just make this a little wider so we can see the duration. So the duration, this one's 30 seconds and then, you know, it, it keeps going. So basically 
in most automation systems, uh, we're included. You will always have you know one line that is playing, and you'll have your counter of you know how many time left to the program, how many time before the next one, um, and it will advance. See here, we have two green lines that just happened there. Uh, for those of you who've noticed, uh, it is not a bug. It is because the events here, the PUB 1060 and 30 events, they are relative events. So those are would be like a, a logo or a visual insert on top of the main stream. So you have the main video playing with your show, and you have, let's say, a crawl at the bottom or a little uh, over uh, overlay ad that comes in. The automation needs to send a command to the graphics generator to do that. And basically, the graphic plays at the same time as the video. That is what is happening here. We have the main video, which is the AR line here in green. And now within that one is uh, nearly four minutes long. And within those four minutes, the first 10 seconds, I had pub 10 playing. It's now done. And the next relative is at 12, uh, 12.19. There we go. So it just started there. So it will continue playing down those relative events at the same time as the main uh, the main event. Um, and it obviously those relative events need to be inside the main event, but that's usually what your traffic system will ensure. And then it will continue working down the line. Um, there's a few you know. Features I won't go into detail, like the, uh, the the show next here, which we usually have. We can see what is going on. So especially when you have very large playlists and you're moving around, you can keep an eye on what's uh, currently playing. Um, automation is really about because as I was saying, you know, there's not any most automation out there. There's not any major feature that are mostly different. It's all about the little things that make the operator's life easier or harder. Um, depending on which side the, you want to look at it. Uh, it. It's what really differentiates one automation from the other. Um, keep in mind also here, it may not look like it, but typically this list, as I was saying before, is three, four, 500 lines long. So it's color coding is very important because with, you know, with 20 lines like this, it's easy to know where we're at. But when you have a large playlist, it's easy to get lost in it, you know, start scrolling and where, where was I, what's going to play next? And sometimes you will have the, the lines, you know, what played in the past as well. You will unload them as you go, but you'll still have a couple of hours up maybe to a day in the past that the art that is still there. So, and then you have the future and how many days in the future do you have loaded? That varies also depending on station. Typically, what we, we recommend is having at least two, three days in advance. That's a bare minimum. What I recommend, you know, an ideal word is at least a week worth of programming ready in advance. Of course, there can be changes up to the last minute, but you should have a base playlist for it because otherwise, you know, someone has car trouble in the morning, he comes in late and well, there was no playlist playing and you end up being on air for a few hours, which is never nice and no one likes that. So by having something on, you know, ready that is at least presentable, you avoid those little uh, life incidents. <clears throat> um, Pascal, so one, Pascal yeah. can you show, you know, like right now, I see all the chain and relative events as the same font. Let's say, by example, I want to be able to differentiate. Yeah, between, that's can I exactly put like the, where I was at English. Okay. Um, so you can highlight also, you know, when I was talking about quality of life, what Claude is uh, mentioning is all what we call appearances. Because here you have the blue ones, which are the played event, the green, which is the one playing, yellow, which is cute, but you have a bunch of other coloring that you can add. Let's, of course, you know, let me show you the, the first example, like, you know, the line that we talked about before, that was the media not found, that coloring stays with it. So this would be what your place would look like, you know, if you have a file that isn't there, that is not yet ready to be played, it's not playable. Automation will also warn you for other mistakes. Like if you've asked a file to play for an hour, but the file is only 45 minutes long. Or, or usually when that happens, it's more subtle. It's like, you know, you have asked for a 50 minute file, but the file is 49 minutes and 37 seconds. So it was cut short a little bit. So it will warn you saying that you've asked the file to play for longer than it is. And there's a bunch of other coloring uh, that you can add. Uh, let's say I want to say I want to have the relative in what would be readable, say in yellow. Not sure if that's going to look good, but just 
and there were few in between. So here you see that all of the relative lines, they're highlighted in yellow. Uh, you can play around. There's a bunch of, you know, we have foreground color, background color. You can uh, highlight them uh, with uh, these uh, little uh, hashing uh, gradient type of color. So that those are all the little bells and whistle. Honestly, for that, everyone has a preference. Everyone uh, works a little different. And it really depends on the type of operations that you are running because you want to have enough you know, color feedback so that you see what you want to see, but you don't want it to look like a Christmas tree either. You know, When the play is played, you don't want colors to be changing left and right because that just becomes overwhelming. So it's all about you know, identifying, like errors are easy. They're all shades of red. There's different shades of red depending on the error, but for everything else, you need to decide what is important for you to keep, keep an eye on. Um, other thing I want to touch on here, everything is in chain, but normally, in a real station, you know, you don't start playing when I click the play button. You know, usually there's a schedule. Um, so normally your first event would be on time. Let's make it at uh, 24. So it's queued for in five seconds, it will start playing. And everything else, usually every like main show is also on time. So on time means that the time that is here will never change. I can change it, but the system will not change it by itself. So what that does is let's say I add an extra line and the system here will highlight and tell you, well, wait a sec, you just added 30 seconds, but that line before was ending when this one was starting. So you, we just created an overlap because you have, we have two things playing at the same time. So the system does warn you of that. And same thing is if you know I wanted to remove this extra file, but by mistake, say I delete two of them, then he's gonna tell me that now I have a gap because I deleted extra time. So there's a, there, there, it will warn me of the, uh, there's a three minute gap in there. So that, that on time is very nice because it allows you, it gives you like validation and make sure that, you know you don't delete something by mistake and end up having it. Because if it all changed, there won't be a gap, but everything will be shifted. So you won't, you won't have the right start time. So typically all the main shows are on time and all the promos and stuff like that, the segments are in chain. So if you play with one, then you're sure that you at the, you know, at the round hour, you're always back to the timing where you want it to be. Um, so that is about it for a very quick, you know, 25 minute uh, introduction of automation, a uh, little crash course on it, uh, because I know you only have an hour, right, uh, Ryan? Right. Yeah. So that's about it for automation. I think I've covered, oh, one other thing that's interesting is in automation, you also have the material editors, you have all the metadata. Uh, ours could also, that's pretty much the, yeah, the stock metadata, but metadata is all configurable. Um, everyone has, you know, duration and uh, description and type. That's pretty much standard for everyone. But after that, you know, yes, we provide a description. Some people have a short description, like here you have a short and a long description, some have some a show title, episode name. It really depends on the type of programming. So that's all configurable. And uh, you can you can have a preview here that allows you to move in the file where you can actually even mark uh, mark ins and mark out if you want to trim the file, uh, which is something that is done mostly in smaller setup because in larger setup you know you have a, a, an NLE like Avid or Final Cut where you would be editing your file and you would not be trimming it inside your automation, but it does give you a little bit of flexibility in some cases. Um, last thing I want to mention is, uh, yeah, I do have a uh, record channel here. So we also have the automation supports recording. So you can have both output and input channels. Uh, it's basically, there's two different interface, either it's a manual interface or this one, which is nicer. It's a playlist. So you can actually schedule your recordings. Uh, we have some customers who, especially, uh, we have a few customers who are closed like for about a month for the for the, the summer season. Uh, and when I say close, I mean, you know, they lock the door, they go out on vacation and they, no one is back for a month. So they load a full month of play out, but they also have some content that they want to record because they have feeds coming in from other stations. So they just set up their recording playlist and at the right time that starts recording, it creates a file and that file can even be played back after without any intervention of someone. 
So it's uh, it's all about automating. And of course, in those kind of scenarios, you need to know in advance the time when it starts. But so it depends on the type of event that you're recording. But when, if you are able to do it, it does save a lot of time. Um, any questions before we move on? I have a couple questions. Uh, first of all, with regard to color schemes and layouts, is it possible for each operator to have their own profile? So they log in and it brings up their color scheme or is there just one standard color scheme for the entire crew? No, each, uh, well, each playlist manager has its own. So if you have it installed on multiple computer, they're all independent for that. And yes, you, we are able to set it as individual color schemes with profile, with basically using Windows profiles. Okay. Uh, you know, when you have your own desktop, it's the same kind of, uh, of separation. Yep. However, uh, it is not something I would recommend because yep. usually you, you can have one or two schemes depending on the type of work that someone does, but usually you would want all operators working with the same task to have the same coloring. Uh, because that means, you know, if uh, one uh, suddenly gets sick, uh, you know, he gets up going to go to get a glass of water and slips and falls and breaks his leg, you know, someone else can come in and he's not all you know, wondering uh, what is happening. Mm -hmm. um, because most errors with automations are actually human errors. Uh, maybe I can share a little anecdote we've had a couple of years ago. A client called in and saying, uh, yeah, they were, the server went to black this morning. We'd like to know what happened. We're like, oh, really? Okay, let's take a look. We started to look at into the, into the logs because we have logs for the automation. So we're able to see exactly what happened up to five days in the past. Mm -hmm. So we start digging into there and looking and that we come at the conclusion that, you know, oh, someone pressed the stop button. That's interesting. <laughs> and what happened is it was the day of the time change. So the guy came in, he had not set his watch. And so he came in and he was like, oh crap, it's the wrong thing playing on air. And he went and stopped the server, re it, and then turned around and he was like, why am I the only one in the office? And then he realized it was the day of the time change. So he said, oh, well, I was not supposed to change the time. And he stopped it and re-queued the right thing and never said anything and said, I hope no one notices. <laughs> oh. So, you know, those little uh, mistakes happen. And, but, you know, it, it's, so it's always about human errors. And th this one is very comical and funny. I mean, and it's not a big impact. Uh, it was, you know, at the off hour with no one, not many viewer watching. And so it, there was no consequence to the error, but it's always about those little things. So if you minimize the difference between the, the various interface between the people, it's easier for, you know, person B to come in and take over from person A without having to change a bunch of stuff and ending up, you know, finding those kind of errors. Yeah, I agree. Um, Maybe one thing also I can mention, uh, this is to Mendel's time change automatic, by the way, because I talk about time change. So that's all done automatically. Basically, it, it knows when the time changes and the time adjusts automatically. You don't have to do anything, except for when the time goes back, you need to provide, you know, a 25th hour for the day, of course, but uh, there's no special manipulation. Second question I have is with regard to relative events, which um, I'm more familiar is calling them secondary events, yeah. But um, how do you determine when the, how, how do you program when those are going to start? So here, I'll just, here just in order to refresh this and put this back on chain just so that we have less coloring. So if you see here, there, so the, the, the interface in the automation is really meant more for monitoring and to modify. So when you build complex relative events, you have another interface in the traffic for that. But the way it works in the automation is your main event is always the one on top. So the one I highlighted here. So yep. starting at 11.50 and playing until 11.53 and 53 seconds. Um, oh, one thing I forgot to mention, all the times in there are drop frame time codes, which I assume you are familiar with. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if, we're, if you're in North America and doing TV, it's all drop frame time code all the time. We just talked about um, that yesterday in class. Sorry? We just talked about that in class this week. All right. So that's why sometimes you will see some numbers that don't exist, and the, the system calculates that all for you. If, if you enter a, a time code that does not exist, uh, it will just give you the equivalent in drop frame time code. So, but to come back to your question, so this one is basically playing for three, nearly four minutes. Look here at the start time. This relative event has the exact same start time as the main event, and it plays for just 10 seconds. 
The other relative event has a start time of 11.52. So it starts basically two minutes after the start of the main event. And here, I don't know, I kind of, oh, I swapped those two lines before. And this one is at 11.50. So, and, so it's really just setting the start and end time of your relative event. And that's how you control. In theory, you can have as many relative events playing together at the same time as you want. In practice, it is kind of rare because usually relative events are not like single graphic element. They are more like a presentation. So you would do those multiple graphics within the graphic system and call that graphic like template or um, so. But if the, the graphic system does support you know receiving multiple commands at the same time the automation can do it uh, you can even do it for video servers however you know if you play two files together well you need obviously two video servers which most people do not have mm -hmm. so the the pub 10 item it mm -hmm. starts at the same time the the primary event starts I, yeah I, was that a man actually typing in the time 11.50.03.02 as the start time for that? Is that how you started it then? Or is that designed in the no, it's itself? Be yeah, because when I dragged it, I put it as relative. By default, a relative event match. The first relative event matches the, the same time as the okay. main event. Okay. So you can you already have the start and the end. It plays all together and you can shorten it. Okay. But as I was saying, if you do a lot of relative events, usually you don't do them by end in the automation. You will do them in the traffic system. And that one has a nice graphic where you actually see like the main event and the smaller, like the main event and the smaller uh, relative event underneath. Yeah. And you're sure that you, know, you can move them around a little bit more like you would uh, see a relative, uh, a uh, secondary event in other systems. Let's assume that let's assume that PUB 10 is a rating icon and you want that rating icon to start five seconds after the start of the program and you want it to stay in for 10 seconds. I would just say do this like this. So you would you would actually man, have to manually enter that new start time and, right then. Okay. And the automation, yes. Okay. Yes, there's no UI to build those relative uh, those secondary events straight in the automation. Some other ways I've seen it done is when you place a secondary event, you can uh, enter an offset time. Like you would say, in that case, I would say the start time is going to be five seconds and the duration defaults yeah. to 10 seconds. So it looks like, I think I see what you're doing. You, you have to enter the, start, the actual start time you want. Yeah, you have to enter exactly. Uh, yeah, I've seen the, the relative, the, like the, the offset, like you say, uh, done before. Uh, yeah. I know other systems, they like open like a kind of secondary playlist. Yeah. Uh, all together. There's for that. There's a lot of difference in the way they're handled. Um, our experience has been that you know most customers that do use relative event, they have a traffic system anyway. So that's why we never developed a more you know nicer looking interface for that because it, there was no never any demand for it at this point. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, the other thing I did not mention, we have another type of event also, which is the manual event, which yep. is very important if you do lives. Because you know, a live event, usually you know when it starts, but you don't know when it ends. So usually you would put the, like in my example here, um, this would be, uh, sorry, this one, the last event before my manual is basically the, uh, the live. And before starting the rest, he stops them. And of course, unless you're very, very precise in both your live stage and your master control operator, you will probably not click the, the start button at the exact same time that was scheduled. So there will be an offset and that's normal and totally fine because the system will do what we call join in progress. Mm -hmm. So basically you create an overlap. You have like your live and you have an overlap with content in case your live doesn't play. And once your live is done, you click the play button, it starts playing at whatever time it is and it just joins where it should be within that, those other events as if uh, the live had never happened basically. So that is fully supported with the man. Yeah, okay. Uh, with regard to the metadata for each of the material items, mm -hmm. does that come in from the traffic system or how does that data get in place here? It depends. Uh, I would say smaller stations, some of them can have only automation. And in that case, the automation in the database here of material is kind of a lightweight asset management system. Okay. Um, if you are a larger station and you have a full 
on Asset Manager, then yes, that data is all synchronized from the Asset Manager. Uh, and it can be exported after that as well. Um, a lot of, uh, of my customers use that metadata to add data for their as run logs, especially for their uh, regulatory uh, logs that they have to submit to the FCC in the US or the CRTC in Canada. Um, so you have to say, you know, what played, but you also have to have some sort of information attached to it so that you can tag uh, different type of uh, shows and count them and stuff like that. So that can come from the metadata. Thank you.